All right, the main event. Let's look at female attire, and you will see that there really was an ever-changing silhouette. Whoa! <laughs> In the 18th century, take a look at all of those skirts. But you'll notice that although the skirt shape changes quite dramatically, the bodice actually remains more or less the same throughout the century, with three-quarter length sleeves and a squared neckline. That really was the staple look. Throughout the 18th century, there were key dresses, the dress that everybody wore, and all of these dresses had names. They appeared at different points in the 18th century, but some stuck around for several decades. The first dress we're going to look at comes from the beginning of the century, and it is called the robe valente, which actually means sort of flying dress. Here's the front, here's the side, and here's the back. And you can see where it gets the volant from, the flying bit, because of that panel of fabric that drapes down the back and down the front. Take a look at her waist, though. You can see that beneath this fabric, her bodice is still fitted to the waist. Do you like it? I think it's extraordinary. Here is another version. And this, it's a little bit different. You'll notice that it is not bodiced uh, around the torso. It actually hangs loose all the way around. And this is called a robe battante. And I wonder if you can guess why it doesn't have a fitted bodice. That's right. The robe battante followed the idea of the robe valente, except that the bodice was looser. Why? Because the battante was a maternity dress. This is why it stayed popular throughout the century, and why it is also known as a robe à l'innocence, a robe of innocence, a dress of innocence. Although if you're wandering around in a robe battante, I think everybody knows you haven't been all that innocent, have you? Another gown that is such an instant signifier of the 18th century is the robe à la française. And this is what it looked like from the front. But this is what it looked like in the back, which is why it's also known as a sack or a sack back. It has this long panel of fabric coming from the shoulders at the back all the way down to the floor in a little train. Sometimes, as I'm sure you can imagine, those trains got very long. But the front, you can see, it isn't like the um, robe valente. It's fitted. You can see it with a stomacher there, but it's the back where all the action is really happening in terms of tailoring. Here is another version with a much a slimmer panel in the back. These panels had, as you can see, pleats in them so that they would fall very elegantly. And here is another one. This one with the pannier, which we'll look at in a second, which is extremely bizarre, as I think you can probably tell already. What a strange way to want to look. But reg regardless of decade, a dress with a panel of fabric at the back is known as a robe à la française. And it still is, by the way. But the robe à la française is sometimes known as the Votto dress. You remember him, right? One of the Rococo painters that we looked at. Well, why is it known as the Votto dress? because so many of the people in his paintings are wearing one. And check this out. This is how people got that fullness at the hip. Basically, this is a bum roll, isn't it? But in the 18th century, it is known as a romp. And take a look at this. I found this quite fabulous jacket. On the internet, when I was picture sourcing, here is the front. You can see it has a little pannier effect. Panniers, by the way, as you will learn, um, was the structure, the undergarment that gave women in the 18th century these very wide hips. But it had a very Rococo uh, palette and look and embroidery too. But check out the back. Sack back.
All right, another variation was the robe à l'anglaise, the English dress, robe à l'anglaise. From the front, it looks exactly like the robe à la française, right? But there's no panel in the back. And here is another version. And please note also the split skirt in the front. We saw that before in the Elizabethan era. We saw it before in the Tudor era. Here it is again, very, very popular in the 18th century. And even these pannier dresses at their fullest could be robe à l'anglaise or robe à la française. And just to remind you, again, regardless of decade, a dress without, without a back panel of fabric is a robe à l'anglaise. It doesn't matter what structure the bottom part of the dress takes. And I just said this, didn't I? Please note the split gown with a visible underskirt petticoat, as this would be more or less ubiquitous throughout the 18th century. All right, the moment I'm sure that some of you have been waiting for, the pannier. Take a look at this dress. This is called the Fanshawe dress because it belonged to Lady Anne Fanshawe, who was very happy to walk around with the widest hips in the world, and we'll find out why in a second. This is what it looked like from the front, and this is what it looks like from the side, a completely different silhouette. That looks like it could belong to a woman with a normal human-shaped body. However, this does not look normal, and it does not look human-shaped. You think that's wide? Check this out! My goodness. You could actually serve drinks and snacks, couldn't you? on either side of her skirt, on her hips. Extraordinary. Take a look at that. Why would woman, women want to look this way? Well, we're going to find out why in a second. I honestly think this was the most bizarre moment in all of fashion history. I really do. I really, truly do. I don't think anything we've looked at thus far has been quite so odd. Even the hoop skirts that we'll look at next week weren't as weird as this. Indeed, the shape of the, the pannier, you'll find out what a pannier actually is in a second. It's the structure that uh, gives the dresses these forms. Yes, it would change shape occasionally. Take a look at that. It's uh, slightly more familiar to our eye because from the front it looks like a hoop skirt from the 19th century, although it isn't, because of course it's very slim. It's very slim on the side. It is so bizarre, and of course we have to ask ourselves, why? Why did women want to look this way? For the love of God, why? Well, first of all, let us quash the old uh, childbearing hips myth. I don't know if you've ever come across this. I certainly have that fashion historians who aren't really worth their salt, whenever they are confused by something, they just say, oh, it's to show they had childbearing hips. Well, if that was true, why did old ladies wear panniers? Why did seven-year-old girls wear panniers? Panniers had nothing to do with the suggestion that women had childbearing hips. It's ridiculous. This is what it was all about. Remember, always remember, the 18th century was defined by man's supposed triumph over nature and his embrace of artifice. Everything that was man-made or altered by man or approved by man was to be revered. Remember that even the natural landscape had been drastically altered by man to form something artificial, an artificial man-made environment, like those wonderful landscapes by Capability Brown, for example, or those manicured uh, gardens and mazes uh, that were so prevalent in this era. Man's triumph over nature. And it was an obsession. And this obsession with changing nature, uh, this idea of improving it constantly to produce something 
extremely artificial and man-made, extended to everything, including the natural silhouette. I said a second ago, this doesn't look like it belongs to a human being. This was really what the objective was. The human form was far too natural. Man had to come in and have a triumph over it. The natural human shape had to be uh, sort of massaged into something artificial. We see it with hair, we see it with makeup, and we certainly see it with this bizarre silhouette. Fashion is not an island. It's a response. Well said, Halle. All right, so now that we know the why, let's look at the how. How are these garments constructed? Well, with these. You've heard me say the word a million times now. Panniers. Panniers. From panier, the French word for basket. So they were sort of uh, constructed like a basket. They were made out of either reeds or very thin pieces of wood. Light wood, like balsa wood. As you can see, they are sort of concertina in design. They have a concertina effect. So when you sat down, the pannier would fold beneath you. Uh, the reeds or the wood were covered in linen. And you can see on the pannier on your left, the entire thing is covered with fabric. And then along with her pannier, a woman would wear her corset and over her corset would go her dress. And this is how it all worked. You know, I'm always saying fashion is not an island. It's a response. You may have heard me say that uh, once or twice in this course. And this means that stuff changes fashion. Fashion does not change stuff, usually. Yet in the 18th century, buildings in France had wider doors to accommodate the pannier so that women could enter a room front on with a modicum of dignity instead of shuffling into a room, walking uh, uh, in on their side. New buildings, were made to have uh, very wide doors because who knew how long the pannier craze would last. But the very rich, of course, if they were living in a building that pre-existed the pannier trend, they simply had their doorways widened. So when you visit Paris, some of you already have, I'm sure, and you visit a chateau from the 18th century, you'll notice that it has very wide doorways and now you'll know why. Here are some contemporary fashion images that definitely draw from the pannier without actually using an uncomfortable pannier. Um, and take a look, totally pannier inspired, but also in Rococo colors with a lot of lace. Oh gosh, fashion really can't get away from the 18th century, can it? And look at this absolutely beautiful dress, completely structured with those pannier hips. And in that teal color that we've seen so often in Rococo art and architecture. And in the case of this dress, it takes so little to turn it into an 18th century gown. Let's look at another dress from a little bit later in the century, the Robe la Polonaise. Polonaise means Polish. So presumably this was a dress that was very popular in uh, that part of Europe, in the royal courts there. And this is what it looks like. It has a very different bottom half to the silhouette, but look, please note, the bodice is really identical throughout the century. And this is what it looked like from the back. Um, the top layer of fabric was sort of hooched up to make these three sort of folded, puffy sacks, two at the side and one at the back. Here is another example of a robe la polonaise, again with that split skirt. And this is what it looked like at the side. Please note the ankles. The robe la polonaise was also distinct for allowing women to show their ankles, which was terribly shocking and naughty and sexy. Ooh ankles. That was hot. 
The next of our popular 18th century gowns was the robe à la criole. Robe à la criole. And by the way, don't you love the way I'm saying all of this with quite a good French accent? Parce que oui, je peux parler en français. I lived in Paris for a while, as you know, uh, and uh, I was married to a Frenchman, Pierre Hallet, Pierre Hallet. And uh, while I was there, I picked up quite a bit of French, believe it or not. The robe à la creole, what does that mean? It means the creole dress. Why? Because fashion is not an island, it's a, a response. I accidentally spoke French then. I almost said réponse. Fashion, ce n'est pas une île, c'est une réponse. Fashion is not an island, it's a response. What was the creole dress responding to? Well, remember? At the beginning of the lecture, I told you that the 18th century was a time of tremendous colonization, territories, all of this kind of stuff. And those of you who have been to places like Martinique will know that France claimed a lot of territory in the Caribbean and in a little state called Louisiana, who they named after their king, Louis and then realized that they didn't really want it and sold it to the newly formed United States for a song, the Louisiana Purchase. The robe à la criole was like this. This is what French aristocrats who were living in the Caribbean or in Louisiana were wearing or presumed to be wearing by the ladies of France. You can see it there, it was a simple white gown, but with quite a lot of ruching, quite a lot of pleats, a sash around the waist, and then this uh, sort of ruffled uh, bodice, this ruffled neckline. There it is, and look, who's that? That's Marie Antoinette and her robe à la criole. And this is a very pretty reconstruction of a robe à la criole. I think it's really cute, don't you? And here is an item I want you to be aware of. Both men and women wore it. It was tailored slightly differently for each, and it's called a redding goat. And basically, it's a, a, either single, but usually double-breasted coat, like this, with a very, very wide collar. Here is a museum uh, piece, a redding goat. Here is a redding goat in a painting, and please check out that little boy's bangs. Wow. And here is a modern interpretation of a redding goat. See? And the last of the dresses we're going to look at is the robe en chemise, which is really shirt dress. Chemise, as you know now, is shirt. Robe en chemise. It's very different, isn't it? Compare that to the pannier or the... Uh, Robe la Française with all of the embroidery and the this and the that. Look at this dress. Here it is again. Tight long sleeves, a square neckline, and just a simple sash. No embroidery, no pannier, no lace, no shit, nothing. You could not get a simpler dress. Right. The robe en chemise came about in the 1780s and 90s. And this new silhouette, what you're seeing here, would absolutely define fashion in the first two decades of the 1800s. So you're going to be seeing something very similar to this when we go into the 19th century. Why? Why did the silhouette, and not just the silhouette, but everything, palette, trim, ornamentation, of which there is none. Why did it change so drastically and so suddenly? Because fashion is not an island, it's a response. There's your clue. What happened? What happened in 1789 in France that would continue into the first years of the 1790s that would change not only France, but fashion and the world? Huh. You'll find out pretty soon, if you haven't guessed already.